process of a four appointment uh, where we ask uh, to uh, direct of museum, private collectors and companies to give uh, us uh, their opinion on the Italian uh, art system. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Alessio Zolloni, curator of this project and co-director of the Executive Master in Art Market Ma Management at uh, UN University. And uh, she's also a member of uh, Art Verona Advisory Board. Uh, at the same time, I want uh, to thank you, Olga Weinberg, director of uh, Hurt, a unique museum of uh, contemporary art in, uh, in Denmark. So thank you so much for accepting this invitation, Olga. And uh, Alessia, I will, uh, I will uh, you introduce uh, this uh, first appointment of uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefano, for this introduction. And I, I want to thank you, Arverona, for this wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, the first guest of uh, Perspective, uh, as uh, said, is Olga Renberg, director of uh, the Ernie Museum of Contemporary Art in Denmark. Uh, the Ernie Museum is famous worldwide for having the largest public collection of uh, of the work of the Italian artist Piero Manzoni, including a number of work by other Italian artists such as Enrico Castellani, Lucio Fontana, Agostino Bonalumi, Paolo Stig. Um, Piero Manzoni, of course, is represented at the major international museum worldwide, like Tate, Guggenheim, MoMA. However, uh, none of these great institutions has a, have a collection the same quality and scope as the one of, uh, at the Ernie Museum, which is, uh, as said, uh, the largest museum collection of uh, Manzoni uh, globally. Uh, can you tell uh, us uh, the history of the Ernie Museum and uh, of uh, its founder, a private collector? Mm. Can I first thank you, say thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very grateful. Um, I'm so lucky. I mean, I'm uh, the director of a museum which was founded in 1977, in which year uh, the founder, collector, and industrialist O. Amgard decided to donate his whole collection to uh, the state, provided they would open a museum. So that happened. But before that, I mean, before deciding to, to, to become in a way, the founder of a museum, his original idea, as opposed to Knud V. Jensen, the founder of Louisiana, uh, he decided he wanted to have artists work in his factory so that ordinary working people would encounter uh, the living modern contemporary art directly where they were working. So you have to imagine a, a shirt factory where they were listening to all sorts of modern jazz and where uh, artists were running around doing performances, painting, uh, all sorts of things. And what he did was that he invited these artists, gave them the same salary as the workers, uh, provided them with a car and a chauffeur, uh, and then they were free to do whatever they wanted. Uh, and that was how he worked until he closed his factory and decided that he would have to go the same road that Louisiana uh, had gone before uh, to open a museum of modern and contemporary art. It's really so, fascinating, <laughs> fascinating because uh, it was an uh, uh, entrepreneur, an entrepreneur uh, as a, a collector and also I think uh, was really forward to invite the artist to give them a salary to work together, to work together with the artist and include the creativity in a, in a factory. Yeah. I mean, he had some idea that he, 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 his love of the arts, he would try to convey to people he knew would not have the strength after work to go to a museum. Uh, because it, it required, you know, education, knowledge, all sorts of things that these people uh, didn't have, but then they should have it while they, they worked. It must have been quite a confusing environment, I have to say. Um, but, uh, but I have spoken to some of the 
some of the women who were sewing there, uh, who's been talking about it, fascinated and at the same time uh, a little scared sometimes. It's something because it's something new, different. It's not a conventional and uh, not a conventional uh, uh, behavior. I think uh, it's not a conventional behavior now, today. Uh, oh. <laughs> think about uh, how many years ago. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, we have become much more um, sort of uh, polished, uh, the whole art world, uh, compared to that type of idea. And uh, um, what is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, what was the relationship of the collector with the artist and the special relationship with, uh, with Manzoni? Why Manzoni? What was the encounter with Manzoni? Uh, Damgaard had um, a painter, um, a concrete painter, um, geometric, um, called Gergo. And he was his painter, but also his advisor on the arts. And he pointed Damgaard towards um, Manzoni, so that when Manzoni exhibited in Gallery Köpke, Arthur Köpke's gallery in Copenhagen, uh, a letter arrived from Damgaard inviting him to spend the summer in Herning with a car and an assistant and the freedom to do whatever he pleased. And, well, we don't have the answer. We don't really know. Uh, we haven't got much correspondence between them. But Manzoni decided, and in 1960, during the summer, I don't remember, but maybe it was three, four weeks he spent there uh, working, apparently like a madman, leaving the works and then returning in 61 in the summer again. And he wrote, which is a quotation we have uh, on the walls of Hart, uh, he wrote home, Sono in Paradiso, which is hard to imagine for, for a man who comes from Milan, uh, that he arrives in Herning uh, and finds it paradise. But apparently the working conditions suited him well. So uh, he left uh, around 37 works, uh, small ones, big ones, and I mean the really big ones, like La Linea Lunga and Socle du Monde. Um, uh, he left them for the collection. And at that point, Damgaard, of course, had no idea that it was a complete treasure that he was assembling. It was at first, uh, it was uh, the first time, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it wasn't so famous, already famous. Uh, no, but, no. Uh, he had, I mean, he, he had good reviews in the Danish newspapers in 60. Uh, so it was not that he was a scandal in that sense. Um, uh, but uh, no, no. Um, and, but he was not super famous and he was just a young, another young, interesting artist. Great. And uh, I was also in the, in the a relationship with other Italian artists because uh, yeah, you said that there is uh, in the collection there are other Italian artists like uh, Castellani, uh, Fontana, Cunellis. Uh, why there is uh, uh, this kind of uh, this body of work uh, of other Italian artists? Skeggi, Bonalumi, yes, um, and a few others, uh, all date back, Castellani as well, date back to those years in the 60s. Castellani came a little later, uh, but he was not invited by Damgaard, but by another uh, family uh, who owned a carpet factory. And that meant that the family owned some Castellanis and we also had two or three uh, from that time. So Castellani was also in Annie and working uh, for this, this family. Um, Mertz and Cunelis uh, was bought during my period at the museum. Um, so that is how we have tried to expand the collection uh, recently with Arte Povera. Uh, works. Great. And um, when, the, when and why the family chose then to donate the, the work from the collection to the state to create a, a museum? 
Yes. I mean, to be quite honest, you could say that, that in, in the neighborhood of Herning, this would definitely be an unconventional decision because I, I, would, I don't think I'm, I'm unfair if I say that most people, uh, and it's quite a, a um, um, uh, there's lots of money in that area because of the shirt industry, the textile industry in, in general, that the general attitude is that you should keep the money in your pocket. Don't give them away. So, so, um, but, but, uh, but he was a different man, uh, Damgaard. He was an unconventional person. And I, I, I think you can safely say that, that he was regarded as a complete wacko uh, in his day by many uh, more bourgeois people in the city. Mm. His wife, who still lives, uh, tells that people would spit after them um, because they were, it was a scandal for people that you could spend that much money uh, on modern art, uh, contemporary art. Yeah. And, um, and now, uh, today, what is uh, the legal status of the museum? And uh, how will the museum fund itself? What is the, the legal status? Well, I mean, uh, to start, the obvious place, I mean, is the community. Uh, generously supports us. Um, and that is a big, I mean, foundation uh, for, 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 fun, for raising the rest of the money. So I raise around between 30 and 40% uh, every year, give or take. And uh, we get some from the state as well, as we are what you would call a state, state recognized museum. Um, but that also means that we have to follow certain rules uh, laid down in the uh, museum law of Denmark. Um, but the funding of the museum and especially, I mean, the acquisition uh, for the uh, permanent collection and for the, and the shows, I usually get the money from, from uh, this very uh, rich landscape of, of private foundations in Denmark. And uh, uh, to raise money for uh, the running of the museum is uh, one of your tasks? You have to do it uh, or uh, if you like? I mean, it's something you have to do in, in yes. your... Uh, yes. So I'm uh, not, I don't, I mean, it's not that I have to buy two tuxedos every year <laughs> uh, because I wear them down uh, because of going to parties to raise money. It's a very simple thing. We don't rely very much on sponsors, but we rely on the foundations. foundations. That means that we spend a lot of time writing applications um, for these uh, uh, foundations. Yeah. And of course, it, does get, it doesn't get easier year by year because uh, the competition is fierce and it will get worse. Mm -mm. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, for instance, do you have, a, let's say, a department or people working uh, with grant, uh, grant proposal for this foundation? Or is something uh, you organize? Uh, uh, I mean, there is someone uh, doing this kind of uh, job or? Uh, writing the applications and yes. so on? Yes. No. Yes. I mean, usually it's, it, we do it in a dialogue between me and uh, one of the curators, uh, the curator responsible. Yes. Uh, uh, so it's a dialogue between how to phrase it, what to do, and how to make this one, because each application, of course, has to be very qualified, mm -hmm. uh, pre precise, and uh, with the right arguments. To um, see. Exactly, because the, 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 the competition for the money is, is, is quite uh, hard. And how is uh, the, the landscape of a private foundation is, uh, is rich? I mean, there are many private yeah. foundation funding culture. Yeah. In that sense, we are lucky in Denmark, the arts uh, and the sciences as well, uh, because we have very rich foundations 
uh, for architecture, for, for the arts in general, for, for science uh, scholarship. Um, uh, yes, so they, they donate a huge amount of money to, to uh, the cultural institution. Less, uh, I mean, uh, is uh, less than a private company. I mean, uh, is more, uh, uh, this kind of uh, task is more of a private foundation, not private company. No, no, no. I mean, I'd say that, that I think it would also be fair to say that, that sponsorships are not that common and there's not an enormous amount of money to get from sponsors. I mean, the big companies who want to sponsor the arts, they usually have a foundation where they can support the arts and not sponsor it. I mean, the new Carlsberg Foundation, the Carlsberg Foundation, the Novo Nordic Foundation, uh, different bank foundations. Uh, yeah, it is done. The, the, the solution is a foundation, usually. Yes. Good. And uh, what, uh, what is the main area, the collection cover, and what is the number of the artwork in the collection, just to have an idea? <laughs> it is, it has passed 2,000. I think it's about uh, 2,200 or something. We get a lot of works, and we have gotten an enormous amount of donations from the artists during the, the past two years and from uh, foundations. So it's grown considerably. Yes, and uh, what is uh, the area of the collection? I mean, there is a specific uh, focus on uh, Italian art, uh, yes. uh, contemporary art. Uh, yeah. I mean, you have, of course, I mean, in a Nordic, even European, even global, the, the Manzoni collection is, it, it's difficult to over, overstate how important it is. Um, it, it, uh, but it also gives us a certain responsibility, of course. Uh, and, um, and we are the only museum with an Italian collection as such, Italian contemporary uh, collection. So, of course, that is something we have to take very seriously. And during my time, I, I've, I've had two shows uh, with Yanis Kunelis, and we are preparing now an Arte Povera show for next April, uh, curated by Bruno Corra. Yeah. And so we, we try to have a keen eye um, on the collection and, and our responsibility in, 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 in relation to, the, to this collection, yeah. which is, I mean, it, which is a, a joy. Of course. And um, do you, uh, does the museum usually buy or prefer commissioning work of art uh, from the artist? So buy or commission? Yes, I mean, what we usually do is we have a, an exhibition. We have divided our shows into three categories, master, masters, uh, future and design. Uh, so that we have an idea what we do, why we do it, and how much attendance and so on we can expect. But, um, uh, where was I? Please repeat the question, Alessia. See, if you, if you usually buy or prefer commission yeah, yeah, sure. or cobalt. So, so what we would usually try to do is to buy uh, from one of the young artists in the future category, when we have a show, we try to buy from the show. Doesn't always, we don't always succeed, but we try so that we can sort of uh, keep up with Damgaard's focus on the new and young art. Yeah. And, and why, yeah. why you said that and not always succeed? Because sometimes it's not uh, easy possible to acquire a new war. Yeah. As I said, there's competition. Yeah. We may write a bad, bad application, or they simply find it uninteresting, maybe. Or again, it might be too expensive, considering it's a young artist. Yes. Some foreign artists um, earn a lot of money at a very young age, mm. uh, compared to what is possible in Denmark, you could say. So that could, ha could happen. So yeah, different reasons. 
So uh, you, you try to increase the collection with the new, new, new pieces by uh, new young contemporary, but uh, looking at the future. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, we also commission works. Mm. I mean, we, for example, we commissioned, you know, when you buy a video work, uh, it's usually an, an edition. Mm. And so you end up owning something that everybody, a lot of others own. So we decided to commission a work from Jesper Just uh, as a unique work only for Hart. And so what we did was we asked the foundation if they would fund him mm. to create a new work. Mm. That, that's something we, we, we all, we also do. When yes. we think that it's, it's necessary, uh, a good idea simply. Yes. And uh, this is a, a, how do you, I mean, how do you assess uh, the potential success of an exhibition? Uh, keeping in mind that there is uh, always a trade-off between uh, innovation, uh, new, and also uh, economic sustainability, because at the end, uh, there is a trade-off between new, uh, new program, uh, innovation, and uh, hmm. the economic uh, aspect. Hmm. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, um, it's a given thing that when we have something called masters, design and future, uh, they, they, can, uh, they do different things for us. Future is the future, the young, new artist, new works for the collection, but no attendance. And we know that. Um, if we were situated in the middle of Copenhagen or New York even or so, uh, the success would be greater, but the future is simply not something we can assemble people hmm. to, to look at, to watch. But this is Everywhere. okay. Everywhere. <laughs> you understand it? It's innovation, it's development, and uh, this is something we, we have to do and love to do. But at the same time, we all know that. I mean, it's also wonderful to have people visit your museum. So the master uh, shows and the design shows are more or less aimed at uh, providing some attendance. Hmm. So, so attendance, 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 that is, of course, always important. But then there's research and scholarship, something where we have been criticized recently for not doing enough. This is also something we have to give more attention, uh, peer-reviewed articles, stuff like that. Uh, that will be a new way of, of judging whether we have a success or not. Then there's the communication, uh, which is always under attack. I mean, it's difficult to be a communications director in a, in a contemporary art museum because you can never do it well enough. There's always more. But this, of course, is also important. How many uh, sightings, uh, how many uh, 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 published articles on us and stuff like that? And then, of course, there's also the network that a certain show or a certain acquisition but a show uh, provides you with. And that mm. is also a success, of course, yeah. for the museum. Yes, just because, uh, I mean, uh, it's important to set uh, uh, our standard, standard to understand uh, how well uh, uh, one uh, is doing. So just to, to set uh, mm. and say, I want to reach uh, this target, and uh, and then uh, you can uh, decide what is success because it's is, uh, hmm. uh, is different uh, according to what you decide is important. Of course, but I mean, if you have had all the money in the world and uh, could buy whatever you wanted, uh, do the shows you wanted to do. I mean, you you maybe you could you could simply say, I don't care if there are any. Uh, I mean, I know museums where it's like that. I don't care whether there's an attendance. We just want to make beautiful, exceptional shows for the people who love it. But on the other hand, there's also, if you have people employed and stuff like that, the satisfaction of having some reasonable attendance mm. is very important. Yes. You simply get people, your colleagues are simply more happy when there's attendance. I bet. Yes. 
And uh, at the end, uh, what are the main challenges uh, uh, facing a museum director? So what are the main challenges in your work? Funding, 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 attendance, attendance, attendance. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> um, oh, we. Uh, there's also the research and scholarship. Uh, I mean, it's a whole range of things. It's also the political side, the 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 social side. Uh, I mean, given that I I'm I'm placed in a provincial town in in Herning, I have Copenhagen, and then I have the world. Uh, things I have to take care of so that I am not completely isolated uh, in Herning. But then on the other hand, I also have to take care of local business. I mean, uh, town hall uh, politics and uh, what goes on in the local environment and so on. So you can see you, you have a sort of uh, geographically a three, uh, uh, three challenges uh, that you have to keep you have to keep stirring them and you have to be there. So, so in that sense, that is where you get the money, that is where you get the support, that is where you, you uh, uh, get to know about new art. So in that sense, I think that's one of the big challenges. Of course, but I think... Uh... I think, I mean, we are completely grounded. We have only the screen left. <laughs> but I think, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult task because it involves different competences. So mainly artistic competence is one. Innovation is really important. But at the same time, also uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, competence because it is, uh, uh, this uh, job involves uh, rising funding, uh, relationship uh, with uh, foundation sponsor so it's a very difficult uh, uh, role uh, uh, we have one, one thing I, I should mention which is which was a challenge because when i came to herning years ago i felt i had to do something extra to to get things running get some attention so we created something called the socle du monde biennale and this today is, is quite successful. I mean, it's the oldest Biennale in Denmark. It may be the only one today uh, left. Um, and and uh, this has been growing and growing over the years. And now it's, uh, it's a small Biennale, my God, yes. But it's, uh, it's big for Herning and it has wonderful, gorgeous, fabulous artists uh, participating. Uh, and this has been a challenge. Uh, it was a challenge to find something we could do um, to get some focus on us. And it has been a challenge to keep it alive uh, over the years. Yes. Because so it's an extra funding beside the museum. Another work, something, yes, yes extra, hmm. yes. Yes. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Olga, for this uh, this time and this conversation, and uh, of course uh, this inspiring conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been a thank pleasure. You. So thank you, Olga. Just can, may I add just one curiosity for me that it's uh, still related to the work of Manzoni, and uh, I imagine that uh, a lot of like a museum or public, uh, both a museum or also private uh, galleries could ask you to lend or to borrow the, the works of Manzoni. How, how you manage it? It's something that you, you're open or? Yes. yes. But I, I mean, there are, two, there are two sides to that. I mean, uh, uh, to lend the works to somebody. I mean, you, on the one side, you have the, the, the urge and need to, to spread the word about the collection and about Manzoni. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have to protect the collection as it is completely unique because its provenance is fabulous because it was created in the place and it never left the place. So uh, we have to protect it. Um, and that means not lending it out so much. So that is a constant consideration uh, what to do. Yes. Yeah. Understand. 
So, but we have, I mean, it's been borrowed to almost every, all, every country in Europe and to the States. And uh, well, it's been traveling the world. And Italy. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, and thank you, of course, Alessia for, uh, for this uh, speaking. And uh, I wanted to, to thank uh, everybody who attended. And uh, just to remember also that the next uh, um, appointment is scheduled for Saturday, 10 October, with uh, Umberta uh, Nuti Beretta. Uh, she's the advisor of the Poldi Pezzoli Museum of Milano and the Fondazione Brescia Musei. And in this case, in, with uh, Umberta, the webinar will be uh, in Italian. So, uh, Olga, I hope to see you and all participants throughout Verona, that I remember will be held from uh, 11 to 13 December. And thank you so much for, your, for everything you, do, you, you teach us. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao.